Streaming live from the beautiful city of Hollywood, Florida, USA. This is SoFloRadio.com. Stuart, Stuart Reed, Reed attorney, attorney, mediator, and yoga, yoga instructor. Here for the next hour to talk about law, mediation, and, and yoga. yoga. And yoga. And yoga. So let's, let's drop, drop into, into our breath and come to order. The, the show, show is, is now, now in session. session. Okay, I hear the mics are hot, which I mean, I guess means it's time for me to start talking. Yeah, that means that's Before I did. I turned them on. Okay, thank you. (laughs) I need an extra brain here on my left, George Rodriguez, so that I don't get dashed upon the rocks. I'll be the left brain. (laughs) And I need Nancy here to have fun, because I saw as soon as they said, drop into your breath and come to order, she's smiling and... Now we're playing war. Why can't we be friends? So <laughs> how can you not be happy and bounce around? That's right. We are bouncing. Let's and I think we're going to talk about serious t- subjects, but still with smiles on our faces and in a happy way. Nancy Brodsky, my friend here, is an attorney uh, also in Broward County in Coral Springs. She's a board-certified marital and family law expert. And we reconnected after years when I went uh, a few months ago to a training program uh, called Collaborative Divorce Professionals or Collaborative Divorce Law, of which she's one of the officers of the organization, I think the vice president. I'm, I'm currently the president. The president. Of the okay. Broward County Practice Group. And, and it's fascinating what, what, what they do with the group where they bring professionals together, lawyers, psychologists, financial planners, and all to give people the best chance of, of, of understanding the issues in a, in, a, in a family case, which can be complicated with children and financial issues, usually divorces. And so they all are, are collaborating or cooperating to resolve things out of court and taking their time so people understand and can make the decisions in the light of so far am i all correct you can Absolutely. correct me no and you're so doing great it's something that that i i'm I w- very glad to to be a part of and and to learn from and 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 that's one of the reasons why i brought n- asked nancy invited her initially onto the show her and randy heller who's a uh, psychologist and professor at nova southeastern university she is she's a doctor she has a phd in marriage and family therapy she's the vice president of the collaborative family law professionals of south florida and uh teaches a class in collaborative um divorce at nova southeastern university so i met both of these extraordinary people Uh, again nancy we we had met each other in court years prior uh at this uh, training program and i thought it'd be a great topic for for the show uh uh, randy's available in in a few weeks so We'll, we'll come back if, if uh, Nancy thinks this is something she'd like to come back to, and we'll talk about collaborative law. And, and since I uh, have, have heard her speak before and know how, how she, she thinks and how professional she is and, and, and understands her profession and her responsibilities, one topic that I'm interested in, not only as a lawyer but as a yoga teacher, are, are ethical issues. So I thought, hey... We could talk about the ethics of yoga how, and they relate to uh, the, the, the practice of law or just getting through conflicts. And this might be a matter of first impression for Nancy. But before we go further, anything that I've left out uh, uh, that, that you want to let people know about yourself before we dive oh, into the God, pool of ethics? Me? No, just uh, I've been practicing for 32 years. And until about 11 years ago, there was really only... Uh, one way that divorces took place and that was by each party hiring an attorney who then in a very adversarial way went about gathering the information for the case and taking the case to court where a judge would ultimately decide it then in the 80s mediation became a part of family law practice where every couple had to have at least a pit stop at mediation before they could go to trial And over time, it was demonstrated that most people were able to resolve uh, their family law cases outside of court through the use of mediation. And then in 1991, 
the concept of collaborative family law was created in Minnesota by a lawyer named Stuart Webb, who basically asked the question, isn't there a better way? Isn't there a better way for lawyers to help people get divorced in a way that is not adversarial from the very beginning? And that was the genesis of collaborative family law. And here but we better are in what way? Why, why do you think it's better if it's non-adversarial? One of the major things that I see my clients experience comparing clients who are in litigated divorces versus clients who are in collaborative divorces is a tremendous amount of reduction of stress on the family and on, on the participants themselves and on their wider family. And, and that's a huge benefit that has really no price tag. I mean, it seems obvious it that is benefit, but but specifically, why is it a benefit to avoid the stress? And now we're sort of going into yoga, too, because as a yoga teacher, I teach people skills that they could use anytime, anywhere to feel less stress and more centered and more uh, present. So, but, but why, as a, a lawyer who well, your bread and butter is conflict, would you want to bring conflict to an end and help people to minimize it. Because I don't see my bread and butter as being participating in conflict, but rather in solving problems. And if lawyers change their focus from winning and losing on particular issues, since every lawyer who practices family law understands that there are winners and losers each and every time, and nobody is a winner on 100% of the issues, that's very rare. And what it changes is instead of focusing on winning and losing, you're focusing on solving problems. And frankly, that's what lawyers are really trained to do, solve problems. Well, I, I like you, have always saw my job as a problem solver and also as a navigator, helping people go through something that may be unfamiliar. They don't know their way to the other side. It's an um, excellent but a lot of, metaphor, the navigator. Yep. But, but a lot of people just look at uh, lawyers as hired guns. That, right. You know, do what I want and, and do what I say because uh, you're, you're here as my tool to accomplish my objectives. Um, do, do you run across that with uh, clients frequently? All the time. And changing the philosophy begins at the very first meeting with the client. Um, not every client is a good fit for a collaborative case. Uh, not everybody can do this. Uh, it sounds easy, but it, it's actually more difficult than simply putting all your cards on the table and letting somebody else decide because you've really got to help people generate solutions and get really creative and persuasive and invested in an agreeable outcome in order to come to that full resolution. And we measure success by whether or not the parties reached an agreement that they could both live with. And it, it also takes the lawyer's ego out of it. And a lot of lawyers, they, they love litigation because they love the winning and losing. They love the gambling. Um, it's high stakes gambling with someone else's life. Uh, if you don't like gambling, and most people don't like gambling with their lives, then litigation's really the wrong model for you to begin with. And really what you need to do is find a lawyer who's not a shark, who's looking to create as much conflict as possible, and look for someone who's a problem solver and is looking to reduce your conflict, narrow the issues, and help generate rational, reasonable solutions that everybody can live with. Super. And yeah, George was nodding his head. So yes. I, no, these are all good ideas. <laughs> what were the thoughts behind those? <laughs> well, you, you know, as, as Stuart knows, I, I wish that uh, it had gone that way for me, you know, instead of uh, the adversarial. Well, we're not going to name names. No. Because you'll know the, the names and many people out there will too. But George, I think, t and if you don't mind, I'm not mm -hmm. going to give, it's just that he, he had an experience in mediation where he felt a mediator really strong armed him and he wound up getting into some yeah. kind of I mean the the whole the whole thing was was bad. I mean, I didn't have what I would consider a, a, a good lawyer or a lawyer that that had my interests in mind. It seemed that everybody concerned was just trying to, you know, get what they could out of it, it meaning me cuz I was the only one with anything. And um and, and yeah, it just seemed that all parties involved were just uh, uh, all, all about getting me to agree to 
to to something I um, that I didn't feel was right that I didn't want to agree to, and I, I was just uh, I just didn't like the whole adversarial nature of it. I wanted I was Remediation. hoping I, I was ho- yeah. <laughs> I mean I, I was hoping that uh, the whole thing could have been settled civilly, you know, way early on, but it you know it didn't go down that way. So I'm a big fan of this whole idea, this whole concept. Uh, well, but I'd also like to it. talk about <clears throat> ethics now while oh, we're yeah. here because <laughs> first of all, like like the what. what George had said touches upon mediator's ethics, or at least what what I came that a, a mediator isn't supposed to take sides or push you to any sort of resolution. Is just sort of there to help you to present your side of the story and to hear the other person's side mm-hmm. of the story. And if you all need some help with creative problem solving, maybe to float some ideas, but not push you one way or the other. It's all about self determination for you to be empowered to make mm-hmm. the best decisions available. And your lawyer is there. To to help you yeah. with your interests, but you didn't feel that <laughs> no. way. But those are those are professional ethics that that like a, a lawyer is supposed to be a zealous advocate and have their uh, client's interest uh, at heart. I'm going to ask Nancy a question now. This is like a pop quiz. It's my father when I first started being a lawyer. He was a lawyer, and he asked me, uh, "What do you think the lawyer's highest professional responsibility is? Is it to your client, the court, the law, mm-hmm. something else?" I think your highest professional ethics are to the rules of professional responsibility which govern our behavior. I think you just answered the question correctly, but differently than my dad said it to me. Because he said your highest responsibility is to your license. You don't do anything. And that's That's correct. That's where you turn to is the rules of professional conduct. The rules of professional conduct say what is and is not allowed to do as a lawyer and ethics are not situationally they're like pregnancy you either have them or you don't there's there's no situational well if the if the you know if the circumstances were right then i would lie for a client there are no circumstances under which i would compromise the my ethical responsibilities as outlined in the rules of professional responsibility. Exactly. So, and I've and I've told people that frequently that you know, sure you're there to advocate for your client. You're there to, I guess, not make too much waves with the judge unless when necessary. When you know, necessary, this, I've um, made some but, waves before. But re- really, you're you, you can't put your license in in, in jeopardy. You got to follow the rules. And then we're we're fortunate as Florida lawyers that they have an ethics hotline where we could call up and speak to an ethics attorney or we have colleagues we can turn to and 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 ask questions and nancy has been a true friend to me when i had a question involving a client uh there 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 are times so so how do you tell a client when they want you to do something that it's sort of beyond the bounds of your uh ethical permissibility Well, I warn clients at the first meeting when they are deciding, they're getting their initial information and deciding whether they want to retain my services to represent them. Um, One of the first things that they're going to learn from me is that uh, I don't lie for clients. I will not assist them in concealing assets, that the rules prohibit that, and they need to understand that, uh, and that In fact, not only will I not help them, but I am obligated to and will disclose that violation um, to the other side and to the court because the rules require me to do that. And I take those rules uh, as seriously as any rules that have ever been given. Nobody's Nobody's ever offered me enough money for me to turn in my law license. And that's what violating those rules is really asking me to do. Um, I'm going to give you a certain amount of money and you're going to turn in your law license. So (laughs) how much is that going to cost me? And the answer is I've never had a client who could afford that price tag because I can't imagine what that price tag would be to compromise my integrity. So clients learn early on what I will and will not accept. And if they don't, if they're not okay with that, they're going to be hiring a different lawyer. So you t- said the cost of giving up your integ- integrity or the cost of your integrity. You didn't say the cost of losing your license. So wh- what, what are you talking about, the cost of your integrity? You mean how you would feel as a person to lose your license or how, or you mean just the, what the license is worth to you? Both. Um, number one, 
I have a family, so my income, this is my, my source of income, so that's important. But more important than that is I have spent a lifetime building a reputation. Right. And my reputation is as an attorney of integrity, a woman of her word, uh, both in and out of the legal community. And I'm not willing to sell that for any amount of money. I was in preparation for this show because it's about ethics. I was reading uh, something called Pirkei Avot, which is the ethics of, ethics our, fathers. of our fathers. Um, just not, not that we're having a religious d- s- discussion here, but just to give me maybe a little more depth and familiarity with ethical issues. And, and one of the, 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 the sayings, it's, the book is basically aphorisms from, from rabbis uh, during the rabbinical period after the ex- expulsion, the, the diaspora. And one of the things pretty much is you can't take your money or your accumulations with you to the grave. What you take with you is your reputation, your good deeds, your, your, your good acts. So, yeah, sure, that, that's, that's, your, that's your reward after you're gone is, yes. is that is you are you having a life that you're proud of or are you having a life that you're going to be ashamed of and it only takes one moment of weakness to blow it I, I know individuals who have lost their career over one moment of making the wrong choice ethically and these are otherwise really good people they're, of course, very bad people who lose their licenses. They steal clients' money. They violate all yeah, kinds of ethical lie obligations. And lie and lie. But I'm, I'm talking about those individuals who I know personally who made one mistake. And but usually that it's mistake because, was enough to cost them their entire license to practice law. And it's usually because of the per- people you're associating with. You're with somebody who's asking you to do something that you should be able to say no to. But for whatever reason, you want to maintain the relationship. You want to maintain the trust or, or, or you just people have a, not a strong enough back, backbone. To- I, I, I don't know what drives these people to say this time I think I'm going to get really close to that line and maybe see if I can get away with it or whether it's just a uh, a moment of not believing that what they're doing is actually a violation despite all the warning signs that it is I don't know Um, I never asked uh, because for these people of course it's an incredibly painful topic to think about why they are no longer um, lawyers Uh, and it's, uh, it only takes a moment to destroy the reputation that you worked a lifetime to build. I guess it depends what that moment is. I guess saying the wrong thing or signing the wrong thing. Or doing the wrong doing, thing. Mm-hmm. So let's go, go into, at this, we can always go back specifically to issues pertaining to lawyers or issues pertaining to litigants or radio show producers. Right, um, anybody. But let's 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 look at yoga, and we'll try to be a little open here to see where we can go with these topics. Maybe use our creativity. Yoga means, by the way, the word unity, and it is very broad meaning. Like bring you bring yourself in touch with your body, with the, your 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 true self, your quiet self. But I also see it means like bringing people together, bringing you together with the world around you. So collaborative law, the way you were describing it, is like a form of yoga. You're bringing people together. You're instead of dividing them and okay so the back to, yoga has ethics believe it or not the yoga that most people are familiar with it's called ashtanga yoga the word ashtanga i believe is sanskrit for eight limbs one of the limbs of yoga are asanas which are the postures that most people when they think of yoga it's standing up bending over okay so that's one of the limbs of yoga i guess the early yogis they recognized that um if, if physically you're limited, you're going to feel limited maybe mentally because it's about unity. It's about ev- everything being connected, your mind, your body, uh, your, your emotions, your community. So, it's, it, so of those eight limbs, the asanas, the postures, also something called pratyahara, which is withdrawing the senses from the world around you, meditation, concentration, trying to lose yourself and and what it is that you that that you're doing uh, breathing exercises and the first two 
which are the ethics of yoga, the, the yamas and the niyamas. There's five of each of them. When I first heard about it, I thought, wow, these are the Ten Commandments of yoga. But they're really not commandments. It's sort of like yoga doesn't command you to meditate. Yoga doesn't command you to do asanas. It's a practice. You do it for, for your own good. And so these yamas and niyamas are for, for your own good, and it's a practice, just things, I guess, to think about. And, and, and a good yoga teacher will have people thinking about these things during a yoga class, just like a good yoga teacher will not only put people in physical p positions, but will also assist them in their meditation, in their breathing exercises. So yama means restraints, things that you try to refrain from doing. Niyama means no restraint things you don't hold yourself back from doing, and you try to do as much as you can. And then the benefit is, that I guess you feel more of a whole person. You don't feel disconnected from yourself, your community, from your better self. So the first of the yamas, things to not do or to refrain from doing, is harming. That's, I think, why you find that a lot of people who, who do yoga might be vegetarians, they don't want to hurt other animals, or, but it also means don't hurt yourself don't talk badly to yourself about yourself. Oh, I'm so stupid. Why do I always do things bad? To, to be kind to yourself, to be your own best friend, to be kind to other people, to be kind to the world around you. So do you think that a lawyer who's practicing the uh, yama of ahimsa, which is nonviolence, it serves the, the, the lawyer? Or do you think that it, it goes against being a lawyer because you're there to sort of hurt the, somebody? No, I, I think it helps. Um, <laughs> I think it's really important for lawyers for a variety of reasons to reduce the anger and stress that they experience as a result of what they do for a living. Um, science proves that stress, mental stress, harms the body. Um, it also harms your mental health. And lawyers are the fourth leading um, profession for suicide. And we have a higher incidence of heart disease, stroke, and the kinds of physical illnesses that are mostly, um, that are most highly impacted by stress. So yoga, therapy, relaxation, time off. But any back of to these ahimsa, things, to nonviolence. To nonviolence. So you, because there are Reducing lawyers out there who think they got to raise their voice and make demands and pound on the tables. You come across them all the time. They're not serving themselves, and they're not serving their clients necessarily. Not only that, they're not even um, getting their point across the way that they best would be able to if they weren't. Um, one of my favorite judges who used to be in family law had a sign in front of her courtroom that says, if you're raising your voice, you've already lost the argument. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you, you've already lost if you have to become angry. Um, anger and violence have no place from lawyers in family law. Our, our highest ethical responsibility should be to reduce that for the family that we are involved with professionally. And that is a high ethical obligation that really is espoused in a... Uh, document called the bounds of advocacy which is a set of rules for is that a secret document i never so seen that one before well it's from the american academy of matrimonial lawyers and it was developed in the um early 2000s and it i just wrote an article in the broward county bar association's newsletter called the barrister about professionalism and i quote extensively from the bounds of advocacy. Is it online that I could it look is it up? Online. Broward you County can, Bar Association. Broward County Bar Association's most current July edition has an article on professionalism and civility that I wrote. And the bounds of advocacy really delineate exactly where the lines are for family lawyers and the kinds of conduct that we should not be engaging in and the kind of conduct we should be aspiring to, which is to reduce conflict to remember that we're working with a family and that the outcomes have long lasting consequences. So what I hear you saying is that you view law to be like a healing profession. That's exactly well. why I became a lawyer. 
to help people. I didn't. Do you believe what you're hearing, here, George? I, I, I do, and because uh, because that's what Stewart said on his first show why he became a lawyer, and and it's I good. I, I think that no, most that's lawyers, not why I became a lawyer. But but that's why you, I stayed a lawyer. That I to, learned but, later to help after people, becoming a lawyer, fairness and solving, you know, mediating, solving problems, and all of that. I think that's probably why most people become lawyers. You're not all bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the bad ones cast a very long shadow over the rest of us and i acknowledge that but that's every every everybody does that with a group that they're not in is they take the 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 negative stereotypes from a minority and use that to let them you know form their opinion when they want to when they want to talk crap about somebody you know or feel better oh, lawyers you know lawyers are this lawyers are that but uh no i mean you guys are all right most of you <laughs> So I was looking to see if anybody posted comments. Well, you know, oh, absolutely! Yeah. If you want, I can uh, sing a song. I could uh, do some, you know, rapping or rap music. <laughs> He's a very talented we, rapper. Otherwise, I'll we could uh, play a commercial <clears throat> one of these days. <laughs> anybody wants to play a commercial here on the Stuart right. Reed Law and Mediation Yogi Show? That's right. Call me. Excellent. Value. Or call George. Sure. Call anybody. So, okay, let's move because there's 10 of these yoga ethics. So we all agree that it's good for a lawyer not to try to hurt anybody and not to hurt yourself, too. I mean, as a lawyer, I bet a lot of lawyers beat themselves up all the time. Oh, I need to work harder. I need to be smarter. And, you know, you just have to do your best and then be satisfied when you know you've done your best, right? I know I'm my own worst critic, my own harshest critic, expecting, you know, Herculean things from myself at times. Yoga helps also to let go and releasing, and that's one of the, the yamas. We'll get to that. I think it's the, the fourth one, letting, letting go of the expectations. Or the, and, and also from the ethics of the Pirkei Avot, too. And th th this is similar. I notice similarities. What you get in the Jewish ethics and, and, and some Hindu ethics, too, is that it's not the, the, the rewards from your work aren't for you to benefit. you got to do your work as if you're never going to benefit from the rewards, your, the rewards of your work, but that the world is going to benefit from, from it. And the fact that they come from two completely different backgrounds, two completely different cultures in different eras shows how universal these concepts are and just how fundamental they are to us as people. doesn't matter whether you were someone from the Indian Peninsula or someone from the Middle Eastern Peninsula or even if you were a Native American who have their own code of ethics, they could be continents apart. But some of these are what we call universal truths. Yeah, like the golden rule. So the, the second rule, which I don't know that we'll have a lot to t say about it because it also seems very self-evident that you're supposed to refrain from lying, from not telling lies. Don't lie to yourself and and uh, tell you, yeah, oh, well, this isn't going to work out. How do you know? Do you Are you... A fortune teller I mean or or don't or refrain from lying to other people sometimes we we, we, we have to lie that's why they don't say don't lie I mean sometimes mm -hmm. like let's say you know your friend just uh, sang at a recital and oh my god it was hurting your stomach to hear your friend singing but hey how was I oh you were great you sounded wonderful sometimes I guess it's okay but this is about refraining kind from, of from like lying. honey do I look fat in this dress in that There's dress? no good way to answer that question except, <laughs> honey, you look wonderful in that dress. Uh -huh. Whether it's true or not. I ask that question all the time. Do I look fat in this dress? <clears throat> not in that dress, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we refrain from lying, and I think that's a good ethic for a lawyer to follow. Or also for a litigant, right? To If somebody thinks, hey, I got to win at all costs... They're probably sort of like some poison inside of them, right? If you think it's okay to lie and to, to just get your way. And lying in court can backfire in a really, really big way. Uh, I once had a client say, I can't do X because my wife, second wife, works on Thursdays. So I can't meet my ex-wife over here to pick up our children on Thursdays. We're a one-car family. I have to drive her. And... That's how he testifies on one day, and then a couple of weeks later, same judge, uh, his wife's employment records show that out of the prior eight Thursdays, she had only worked two of them. And the judge stops the proceedings and 
um, gives him a Miranda warning. Anything you say can and will be, you have the right to remain silent. Hmm. And then he told me to go outside and explain to my client why he had just done that. And I had to go out and explain to him that, you know, the judge remembered that he said, my wife works on Thursdays and now he's just seen proof that you've lied, that she doesn't work Thursdays. She's only worked two out of the last eight Thursdays. So you better go clean up that mess. And he came back in and I explained to him what he needed to say, which was he didn't mean to mislead in his answer to the question. When he said that his wife worked Thursdays, he did not mean to imply that she worked each and every Thursday. And the judge didn't put him in jail. That was the closest I ever had to watching a client literally go from a hearing into jail for lying in court. It can happen. Have you ever seen a client go to jail? Or anything uh not for lying civil. not for lying but that was as close as a client of mine because I, I only had one client and and uh it was because the person was pounding on the table like you say you should refrain <laughs> anger doesn't serve you mm-hmm. and the judge was telling the person you got to calm mm-hmm. down and i'm saying you got to calm down he kept raising his voice and pounding on the table and the, the judge says oh. and and also there was this was about refusing to pay alimony so you know, okay, go calm down, and when you're ready to be calm and pay what you're ordered to pay, you you can uh, we'll get, we'll open up the door for you. Right. I've only seen people go to jail for the reason most people go to jail in family court, which is willfully refusing to pay their alimony or child support when they clearly have the ability to pay. Right. Got it. Don't lie. And I'm not pay. looking at you okay. for any particular no. <laughs> reason, just because you're here. Hey, I'm I'm out of jail. <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> okay, so the next of the th- things that we're supposed to refrain from doing is not stealing. Well, obviously, you should never steal, like stealing, taking something from somebody else, but it also means more broadly not taking something that you don't merit, that you don't deserve. You don't take credit for something that somebody else did, or really to uh, have what you what you deserve in life, not just to take and take and take i guess that's a good ethic for well, it certainly what? applies to lawyers both on the <laughs> literal level the number one reason that lawyers lose their licenses is for stealing clients money and i mean that's that's pretty basic you, you aren't can't you making take somebody enough? else's money <laughs> um, but, but you had also said that s- otherwise good people sometimes make a bad decision at yes. the wrong moment so i guess the practice of the ethics of yoga can help to keep somebody out of trouble and make the right decision when they're presented with the opportunity to make the wrong decision. If there's somebody who practices these ethics by reading about them and thinking about them and really taking it to heart, because people think can change, right? I think the key is really taking it to heart because I've seen people with outwardly, um, outwardly expansive, philosophically moral practices, whether it's yoga, whether it's a particular religion, or some other type of discipline, who are nevertheless very dishonest people. So I think Mm -hmm. it's not enough that you do it, you have to you have to live. Well, that's integrity, you have to take it in. I guess some people don't have integrity. And that's why it's good to have be a judge of character and to trust yourself, your instincts, if things don't add up with people, they they give you a good show and uh, but something doesn't feel right to you, you know, and it's it's the most important quality I think I look for in anybody that I'm going to deal with. It's certainly what every person out there should look for in their potential attorney. Integrity. Integrity, first and foremost. Um, if you don't have that, it's kind of like your health. If you don't have integrity, you don't. I don't care what else you have. Right. If you don't have your health, you don't have anything. I think that's why my dad wanted me to be a lawyer, and he would because uh, for when I was in high school and even college, no, dad, it's not my thing. I'm. I got other things, but oh, you're you got what it takes to be a lawyer because of your integrity. I'm like really, is that yeah. what a lawyer <laughs> needs? But yeah, now I understand it. But then I was still a young boy. I didn't get it. But thank you, Nancy. So the okay. So let's. Uh, anything else we should talk about? Not stealing. Don't steal. Or we should just tell Inte- our audience. In- integrity is good. Uh, integrity <laughs> is good. <laughs> so then the next of the yamas uh, is brahmacharya, which is uh, a restraint. Where I guess most people know it, meaning uh, 
chastity or celibacy, but I think broad, more broadly it means don't overindulge. Don't overindulge in, in pleasures, in, in food, in drinking, in, in sex, and in, in, in any, you know, you, you should, everything in moderation. And I think that there are lawyers who get into trouble because they're not controlling their impulses, either sex with clients or maybe they have a gambling habit or, yeah, it's good to set boundaries and not overuse your energies. Yep. I, I think compulsive behavior, compulsive indulgence uh, is something also that lawyers struggle with um, for a variety of reasons, but substance abuse um, is high because, again, you have people with poor coping mechanisms. They're under a lot of stress and they're not coping well. Therefore, they turn to substances to help them cope. Uh, which we all know is not actually a coping mes mechanism. It's just a masking and the problems are still there. So that is a very big problem among the legal profession. Fortunately, we have a, a strong program for lawyers with substance abuse issues, out, you know, alcoholism and drug abuse um, to help them. Um, I have been in touch to with them to, to offer uh yoga and meditation courses to the lawyers in these programs. And I, and I think I've told you before, I have a, a course approved by the Florida Bar to give attorneys uh, continuing legal education credits for learning meditation and, and yoga. Actually, the yoga part is not approved for credits, but to learn about mindfulness and meditation. And it's also like a networking event. I have had it at the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce. And then for a while, I'm thinking, it's so hard promoting events. I'd rather somebody else say, hey, Stuart, come do the event for my organization and, and I'll set it up. But I don't think that's, I, then I'll be waiting too long too. So I'm going to start doing it at my yoga studio. Even whether it's one lawyer, you, you can come and bring friends and we're, we're, we'll donate all the money to a charity. It'll be a karma yoga event too. But the, I think the, the, the value is you get your continuing legal education credits, you learn good coping skills, to you learn how to feel good. Um, but also it's good networking for lawyers. We, we have a nice time together. So I want to invite you. I'll, set, Thank I'll, you. I'll, I'll, I'll coordinate the date with you. Sounds and, great. And uh, you come check out the I Love Yoga studio on Dania Beach Boulevard. Sure. Super. It's a nice I place. love this show. It's a Thank great you, show. Uh -huh. This is a good show. So now I mean, yeah, this show, but all yeah. the shows too. It's been you, you, thanks for the, the opportunity. You're just getting better all the time. Okay, so okay, we agree. Lawyers shouldn't uh, should have some boundaries. They Lawyers have. need boundaries, healthy boundaries. And then the last of the yamas, the restraints, is uh, a parigraha, which is restrain yourself from being too attached to things. And so people look at it also as giving up material things, donating to charity or, or, or not being too materialistic. But it's also not being too attached to that you're right all the time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, sometimes I can be wrong. You can learn from other people. In fact, the back to the Pirkei Avot, The Ethics of Our Fathers, it's really a book about wisdom more, I think, than about ethics. They say, who's the wise person, the person who learns from other people, that you find the wisdom in, in mm -hmm. everybody. So, uh, yeah, not to be too attached. And I think that, that being uh, an effective healing type of lawyer is to talk your client through it, too, is don't be so attached that this case has to have one outcome. You know, if you can get out there and you're still standing and you can dust yourself off and you got a brighter future, that's, that's a, a good outcome for a lot of people. I agree. And I think a lot of family law attorneys get too invested in particular outcomes and collaborative practice really has helped me in across the board in my cases, even in my non-collaborative cases, which still sadly make up the bulk of my practice. Um, I think it really has let me lead a better quality of professional life because I am less invested in the outcome. I used to lose, lose sleep over an outcome. I, I don't lose sleep over it anymore. I've learned to let go enough. And it really helps lawyers to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, especially you said in the collaborative process, because the outcome in the collaborative process, it's not like you all of a sudden you're on the chopping block and this part's yours, that part's yours. The collaborative process is more of a becoming fine tooth a, thing. Yeah. Becoming a collaborative attorney exclusively and mediator exclusively 
um, would be for initial divorces would be an ideal for me because I will tell you, you don't experience any of that stress and that desire for a particular outcome and the need you it, it just simply removes it in collaborative practice. And it is far and away the best quality of life for the lawyers involved. Um, and it's the best process for the clients involved. I have no doubt about that. I agree. So always when somebody comes to me and they're like, I, I want this, I want that, I want that. I'm like, well, what does the other person say? Have you spoken yet? Let's see what we can do. Always you try to come to a, a collaborative or cooperative uh, solution because if you fight for one particular outcome, you don't know what the outcome is going to be and, and the costs may be high, not only financially, but emotionally. Losing sleep is no not good for your health. So, so let's now go to the things, just in, because of, of, of time, the things that we're supposed to not refrain from doing, that you do as much as you can. These are part of the practice of yoga. Uh, Sausha, which just means cleanliness. I think it's not only just, you know, taking a bath, but also cleanliness of thought. Not, it's, it's, I guess it's not, not enough to, to keep yourself from not t talking in a degrading manner about other people, but also to try to not think in a degrading manner f about other people. That if you find yourselves, because I mean, maybe you grew up and people talk that way around you, your family, your friends, and you just pick up bad habits and, and you're always like cutting people down in your mind. So you try to think in a more clean way. And I think as a lawyer, I, I get the analogy when you go into court as far as cleanliness, that you, follow, you, you have to follow the rules of professional conduct. So it's like a surgeon going into an operating room and walking out with the white coat still clean without the blood splattered That's all over. That's a good over. analogy. Yeah. So you go in there and everything's dirty and everything's fighting, but you're keeping your hands clean. And I think that also gives you credibility with the decision maker. There's... No question about that. And one of the ways that I see it demonstrated um, really clearly is in lawyers' dealings with people who are representing themselves. Um, lawyers should treat a self-represented party with, the ex with as much deference and perhaps more than they would treat a fellow lawyer. Yet I repeatedly see lawyers talking in a very degrading manner, a very condescending uh, unnecessarily harsh manner to people who are self-represented because they think they don't they don't hold themselves to the the same standard that these people are not as deserving of their professionalism as another lawyer would and it's exactly the opposite in the bounds of advocacy even in our oath of admission to the Florida bar which was changed to say that to all litigants, attorneys, courts, I pledge civility and honesty in all of my communications. And people don't, they don't do it. They, they think that they can be nasty to someone who's representing themselves and that there should be no consequences to that. And I, I just want to let everybody know that if maybe half of our audience or more who was watching on Nancy's live feed, her phone just <laughs> fell on the ground. So you're going to have to... That's okay. The battery al al already died. Oh, the battery died? Okay. Yeah, I was unaware. Ago. So you switch to my Facebook page or go to soflowradio.com and we're still here live. There's a TV button. Yeah. And, it looks uh, like a TV. He's like so I'm, on top of I'm things. trying to... be an <laughs> iTunes. There is yeah, iTunes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, 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 he changed my... Uh, my my, my personal website and put a link on there and I'll so get all the Stewart shows. They're there. If forever. you want a show, this is the guy to turn to anybody. That's right. They're all there forever. You live forever in the cloud. <laughs> <laughs> so, Oh, let me plug one thing while, while this is occurring to me. Cause I already plugged the, uh, the CLE course for attorneys. I have this, uh, cause we're talking about divorces and, and family issues at the yoga studio where I teach. I, I put, and they always often say you teach what you most need, right? So I have this workshop <clears throat> called Yoga Healing for Divorces and Breakups. And it's actually, it's not like a weepy, sad thing where people talk around, you know, sit around c crying about how bad it was, but it's about the ethics of yoga, about not being attached, about living in the present, about the, the next thing that we're going to talk about after cleanliness, Sausha is Santosha, which is being content. 
that you don't refrain from being content. You count your blessings. Sure, your your relationship didn't work out, you know, but there's you were born. There's no guarantees. And while you're here in the world, there's opportunities to have good friends and happiness. And, and sometimes you need to let go in order to move forward and have those opportunities. So this workshop is going to be July 22nd. It's a Saturday from 7 to 10 p.m. If you or any friend that you have uh, a, a, that you know uh, you think can benefit from uh, finding ways to cope with a divorce that, that makes them that you're just dwelling on too much and you feel trapped in the past and you're too sad, you, you come to this workshop, you meet some nice people, you do some yoga and meditation, we even dance and we turn on the disco lights in the studio. It's a lot of fun. You should feel okay to send your clients there. It's not too goofy. It's actually based on all these yoga principles we're talking about. So contentment. Be yeah. as content whenever you can, however you can. Stopping and smelling the roses along the way. Gratitude, as they say, gratitude is an attitude. And if you focus on the things that you're grateful for, it'll get you through those things that you wish you weren't dealing with right at that moment. Because no matter how bad things are, there is something to be grateful for. So just find it and focus on that. And it's healthy. It makes you feel good. And and this isn't one of the this is one of one of the niyamas but i think also smile it's like so so if you find things to be grateful for you feel good if you just make yourself smile it feels good too you know like the charlie chaplin song i said it on the first show mm -hmm. I, I repeat myself a lot but you know smile and you feel like crying it's just healthy count your blessings and and, and smile and do an experiment walk around in the grocery store with a smile on your face. And when you look at, when you pass by people, just smile at them. See what happens. See how many people smile back at you versus when you walk around with a blank expression on your face. You'll notice a lot, everyone will smile back at you. Happiness is contagious. It is contagious. And you know what? That might be just one little pleasant thing for the day. Put a smile on somebody's face. The yoga of smiling, bringing people together. Together. When I do that, women think that I like them, and you know they call the cops. <laughs> That's what's going on inside your head, <clears throat> or maybe unless the cops have actually been called. No, not lately. We just lost your uh, video. Huh? Oh, they, uh, you know, screensavers. Oh, screensaver. Yeah, don't freak out. <laughs> Take a breath, Stuart. Breathing. Oh. That's on here, right? Mm -hmm. So that that's one of the practices outside of the yamas and niyamas. So okay, so be content. Uh, the, there's there's a quote. Uh, uh, Cic I'm forgetting his name now, but like one one of the Roman emperors or Roman Cicero. Cicero that gratitude is the is the greatest of all virtues and the parent of all the others. That if you're grateful, you're you're giving. If you're grateful, you're you're patient. If you're that it, it really gratitude leads to all kinds of Good things, and then also the book that I read to prepare for for today, the Pierre K. A vote. Who's who's wealthy? The person who's content with what they have. So yeah. Okay. So yoga, we're bringing it all together, bringing different traditions together. So there's contentment. Those are two of the things to not refrain from doing. Then there's tapas, which means uh, discipline, that you really try hard, and not only discipline, but also like being into what you're doing, to have your heart into what you're doing. And I think that helps somebody in the practice of law, right? <laughs> Not to be lazy and really to care about what they're doing. You, you have to be diligent. Um, our, our profession requires a lot of um, follow-up, being uh, attuned to what's going on. Uh, and failure to do that is the number one reason that clients complain about their lawyers is they don't follow up with me. I don't know what's going on. They don't keep me in the loop. They're not being diligent and following up on what they said they would do. Number one complaint, according to the Florida Bar. Mm -hmm. So be diligent not in your communications, as well as in just preparing your case. Exactly. And preparing your arguments, but also in your relationships. Be diligent in maintaining a good relationship with your clients. And I'm going to tell you something else my dad taught me, which sounds bad. But I think he meant it in a good way. He says, your client is potentially your worst enemy. 
but I think that it, what that also means is treat your clients well. <laughs> so you don't put yourself in a position where they want to be adversarial with you. And your client can be your best source right. of future clients. So turn every client into a walking billboard for you. Treat them well and they will sing your praises. Treat them badly and they will tell everyone they know never to call you. I know I do. <laughs> oh, I, mean, <laughs> I can't wait to find out who your lawyer was after the show. Yeah, I'll give you his phone number. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we had many tearful conversations with each other. Yeah, years ago. but I'm better now because I went to Stuart's class. Yeah, he did. He went to the divorce yoga healing class. All healed. The first one. That and the beach. Yeah, that was all part of the healing process there. Stuart's class and then the beach. Oh, but that's the- important. There yeah. is a healing process from divorce and people don't give yeah. that enough space. Oh, there's um, light at the end of the tunnel. Bright, beautiful light (laughs) but it's really a privilege to be able to see sometimes i i describe my clients as having come in like a wilted flower you know and and through the process even though sometimes it's very painful and it's very difficult i get to see them open back up and become a healthy flower again well for me what did it because because i really was not happy about getting divorced when it happened to me now nine years ago is that once it it, it actually was done, and I realized, wow, half the time now, because we have a, a daughter, half the time I have a life of my own, and I do things that are just for me, for my own good. And now when I'm with my daughter, it's just me and her. So it's not that somebody else is in the spotlight or, or somebody else. It's just me. So I have a closer relationship with my daughter, and I think I have the time to be better to myself. So having the freedom sometimes. I mean, I'm sure that a good relationship is a blessing, and, but, but if, it's, if it's a relationship where, where you, you feel you're not appreciated or you're taken advantage of, you're treated un, unkindly, if you're able to get yourself out, you're able to heal and grow and maybe get a better life. Few things are better than a really good divorce. <laughs> <laughs> Or the I'll joke say, is, the one of the why, divorce why do attorneys. divorces cost so much? I, because because they're, they're worth, worth it. it. Yeah, I had a really horrible divorce, and um, I'm so glad <laughs> well, that, that I had it. I mean, uh, it would, would have been nice if it had been nice, but, uh, you know, had to be done, and I'm sure glad it's uh, over with. Well, I'm happy to say that I had an uncontested, uh, amicable uh, mm. divorce 12 years ago, uh, wouldn't have done it any other way didn't know about collaborative at the time but we frankly resolved it all between ourselves and um i think we can both say that we're both in a better place now than we were you know in the year leading up to our divorce uh so a good divorce can be the best thing uh for your life if the relationship you're in is not meeting your needs uh, is you know, life's too short for the most important relationship in your life to be the only negative thing in your life. I, I didn't know about collaborative divorce either. I also didn't know about well, no still fault. in its nascency. <laughs> no fault of. divorce. I didn't know that Florida was a no fault state or what that meant or any of those most things. Most people all still you have to do The marriage is yeah. broken. Wow. Yeah. What a shocker. I really would have. They should have a sign right there on the border. Do you know what no fault divorce means? No. Should read up on it. Before you go too deep into this state, <laughs> and before you date, before you talk to women, read up on that and what that means. We're going to talk about this after the show, okay? <laughs> Help you through no, this. No, it's all good. Thank you. I, I know. I heard there's a class you can take. Yeah. A healing, yeah, a divorce healing, and uh, oh yeah, 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 on the twenty second <laughs> at the Olive Yoga Studio. And and sort of what you 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 were saying about the the person being in a bad relationship that you know this is your one life and and why have the relationship be so so negative and uh, one of the other yoga things i'm trying to find a segue it's sort of a bump sometimes it's a bumpy landing but um the svadhyaya which means self-study that you should as much as possible not only self-study but study of wisdom which i guess is anything that's true Uh, science so so study and so, so that you really understand yourself, you understand the world, 
And um, I guess that helps somebody who's in a bad relationship if they will study themselves and think, is this really good for me? It's kind is of this the, the way essence I want of a live? therapeutic process. I mean, people say, why should I go to therapy? Um, and the answer is because it is in therapy that you will learn things about yourself that are causing you distress in your life. And unless you're a really, really, really content and happy person, you've probably got some unresolved issues that you don't even recognize. And therapy, individual therapy, can help reveal those things and really unblock you from some of these struggles that you're having in finding happiness in life. We are often our own worst enemies. Yeah, most people are. In fact, I had to go to an emergency room a few years ago to see my, my grandmother, and I noticed that just about everybody in there is there for something self-inflicted, either you know, a drunken car accident or somebody drinking too much and falling asleep on the beach and getting bad burns, or people having heart issues because of uh, not taking care of themselves. Most people put themselves into the hospital, it seems. I agree that it is a huge issue and people don't often understand how much power they have over their own sense of well-being. It takes work, though. It's, it's not something that we come in with a natural state, most of us, with all of these skills on how to deal with the stress that is in our lives. Um, and there's no one answer that's right for everybody in my view, but unless you're one of those rare people who's walking around right now with, um, a perfectly content attitude, 99% of the time, self-actualized, you need to look for one of those things that works for you. Yoga, and so a religious practice, uh, um, uh, some kind of a physically disciplined practice, exercise, acupuncture i don't know anything so understanding yourself is an essential part of being able to heal yourself and to grow and that's one of the the niyamas things that you try to do as much as possible and that combined with refraining from lying not lying to yourself or about oh well i guess i could take this it's not that bad or you know if you understand yourself then you know really what's good for you and how do you want to live let me hit, hit, go jump into the last one because i see the the clock is getting close Three to minutes. the hour and the, the which brings us to the last thing that you don't refrain from doing but it's got the longest name it's also sanskrit i think it's called isvara pranidana which means serving a higher purpose and it's up to you to decide what that higher purpose is is it your family is it your community is it your your sense of what a, a global creator is and your responsibility to other people maybe it's honoring your ancestors or but you're serving a higher purpose you're not doing things just for yourself how does that fit in with the practice of law well that that is what lawyers do we you know most of us got into this to help other people through difficult times um, that's why I became a lawyer to help other people and by helping other people I'm serving a higher good uh, I've done other work uh, nonprofit work, uh, serving the community in a variety of ways. And those things ultimately make me feel good about me. Uh, it's, it, it looks altruistic, but it isn't because yeah, the when connections you, you make, the reputation you build and, and the feeling that it gives me is, is a self-fulfilling good feeling. So, you know, it's like a drug when you do for other people, you get a feeling back that is kind of like the high that you get from any kind of mood altering substance. So it's kind of like a free high every time I do something for the community, uh, volunteer, serve on a, a board of an organization that does work. Uh, and the good feeling lasts a little longer than just having a glass of wine. It does. It does last longer than the wine does. Maybe all weekend. Sometimes for a whole month. <laughs> that's good 
That's good. Or, or what you do, it could last a lifetime too. Like I have so many uh, good friends in, in Miami Beach from the days that I was out there with them trying to uh, promote good development and, and stop bad development. And, and I was involved with a group of people who were able to uh, enforce an easement along uh, the uh, government cut in South Point Park so that now there's a continuous walkway from the ocean all the way to the marina. Um, that was you? And well, I was part of the group. I'm the one that when I looked at the easement, I told people, here's, here's, your, here's your winning ticket. And the funny thing is, this easement was in a deed that was signed over by an Alaskan Indian tribe. They called it the Alaska Parcel in South Beach because it was a federal property, and the federal government settled with an Alaskan tribe by giving them real estate, <laughs> waterfront real estate, in, in Miami Beach. <laughs> you can't make this stuff uh -huh. up, can you? It's Did they use it? Yeah, it's, it's now tribe? part of the. Oh, the tribe? No, no. I think they just flipped it. <laughs> I was, they just, I was but they, but they that put would the be a funny movie, there. you know, like the Beverly Hillbillies or something. You got all these Alaskans living on the beach now. Uh huh. You know, Inuits. That would be great. Building igloos out of styrofoam. I don't know. I think I've seen huskies playing in in the water. Yeah, there. huskies like it everywhere. Uh huh. It's a beautiful place. So we're we're listening to Spirogyra's um, morning dance now. No, catching the sun. Catching no, the sun. There you go. So enjoy the music on the way out. Enjoy the day. Enjoy the 4th of July. How do we find, your, how do we find your guest Brodsky. before you close? Yeah, how uh, do we find her? She, you can find me at BrodskyJacobsAssociates.com, B-R-O-D-Z-K-I, and I can be reached at 954-344-7737. Excellent. Now you can close the show. I wanted to make sure. And you know where to find George because he's at this right place, but I'm not going to say it yet because he told to. me that yeah, the show's over word. when I say it. It's, yeah. it's the magic word because also magic. you could find me online. Uh, I have a website, lawandmediationllc.com. If you type in Law and Mediation Yogi, you're not going to find anything. But maybe <laughs> on Google it'll show up. I, I put in Law and Mediation and, talk did, show. Did, did, and you came right up. Oh, super. Yeah. I think it's in part thanks to you, George. So uh, yeah, I get all the credit. We're we're gonna have <laughs> fun discussions coming up in uh, future shows. Nancy was an awesome guest. Thank you. And George, maybe later. Yeah. Um, how about a firm handshake? All right, there we go. Okay, SoFloRadio.com is the place for great talk show. Thank you, George. Thank you, George. Streaming live from the beautiful city of Hollywood, Florida, USA. This is SoFloRadio.com.